It's a huge water tower. No, it's a grain silo. No, it's a SpaceX Starship, a craft destined for outer space, and its ambitions are dwarfed only by its sheer size. One look at this 30-story building of a craft and one can't help but wonder, why on earth is it so big? Can it really get us to Mars? And when can I finally have a weekend at a quaint little bed and breakfast on the moon? Talk about a whole new meaning for moonshine. This deserves a deeper dive here on Tuba Da Vinci. I remember a joke from my aerospace engineering days that you could get a refrigerator to fly so long as you strap a big enough engine to it. And that's exactly how I felt about the Starship when I first saw Starship SN5 get 150 meters off the ground. It seemed outlandish, but then it happened. After a few more hot flights and static test fires, SN9 took to the stage and now with a nose and flight control surfaces. And then I started to see the SpaceX Starship for what it truly is. The next evolution of humankind's journey to the stars. A massive leap for mankind. And I mean massive. Standing at over 393 feet or 120 meters tall. Seriously, it's huge. It's the biggest spacecraft of all time. But that doesn't even really do it justice. So let's compare some of the biggest spacecraft we've ever made. First up is the Falcon Heavy at 70 meters. SpaceX's pride and joy until Starship is ready. Then is the Russian Yenisei at 80 meters. Moving up, we have the Long March 9 from China at a whopping 93 meters. Next up is the ambitious NASA SLS Block 1. This is America's planned replacement for the space shuttle, and it stands at 98 meters tall. Up next is the Soviet N1 at 105 meters. Then is the legendary Saturn V at 110 meters. Rounding out our list is the NASA SLS Block 2 cargo variant standing at 111 meters and is the closest comparison to Starship, which trumps them all at 120 meters. How tall is 120 meters? That is as tall as a 28 to 35 story building. In fact, when Starship is placed atop its launch pad in Boca Chica, Texas, it stands as the tallest thing around for hundreds of miles. But talking about its height doesn't fully capture what this juggernaut is all about. What's equally, if not more impressive, is how wide this thing is. At nine meters or 30 feet in diameter, Starship is about as big as my house. Using an NBA basketball court as reference with the average size astronaut, this is how big Starship would be. To break this down a bit, Starship is the name given to the entire launch vehicle, which consists of two stages. The first stage booster is called Super Heavy because of its delicate and fragile proportions. No, I'm, I'm kidding. This thing is a beast, capable of taking more cargo to space than anything before it. After the stage one Super Heavy is jettisoned, the resulting spacecraft, the upper stage, by itself is weirdly also Starship. For clarity, for, <laughs> for clarity from here on out, I'll be calling stage one booster Super Heavy and the stage two craft Starship. Our fascination with space really stems from humankind's deep desire to find some cosmic neighbors. And on this scorecard of intelligent life, being a spacefaring society is about as advanced as it gets. So if we turn the tables and judged ourselves by these same metrics, how would we score? And how can the massive starship hope to make us an interplanetary species? Let's start with the one biggest challenge, just getting off the ground. To understand this multi-stage booster approach, let's nerd out a little bit and talk about the gravitational equation. I promise this will be high level and brief. In fact, my first iOS app I ever built was a game oddly similar to Angry Birds Space based on this very equation. I've never figured out how they stole my idea. And don't even get me started on the PlayStation 2. My idea, by the way. PlayStation 1 came out, thought it was pretty good. And I thought, you know what would be better? And for a couple years, they made something better graphics. And then PlayStation. The force of gravitational attraction is this equation, where Me is the mass of the Earth and Mr is the mass of the rocket. The mass of the Earth is constant, and so is G, the gravitational constant. So the higher the mass of the rocket, or the closer the rocket is to the Earth, the stronger the gravitational forces will be pulling them together. Interestingly here, the denominator is R squared, which means if the distance between two objects doubles, the forces of attraction are only a quarter as strong. So the hardest thing to do here is get off the ground, and with each meter you rise, it gets easier and easier. So Super Heavy is a massive tank that holds both liquid oxygen, or LOX, and liquid methane. The resulting fuel is called methalox which powers the Starship Raptor engine. Eventually, Super Heavy will have between two and three dozen of these Raptor engines. And after a few minutes, it will have exhausted its entire payload and be totally empty. At this point, hundreds of miles above the Earth's surface, Super Heavy becomes nothing more than dead weight. 
So rather than carrying around dead weight, it is jettisoned. Now, with a huge advantage thanks to Super Heavy, Starship ignites its six Raptor engines to finish its orbital escape. Looking at the gravitational equation, the spacecraft has lost a lot of weight and is also hundreds of miles away from the center of Earth, hence the need for only a smaller fuel supply and only six engines. But even with this advantageous starting position, nearly two thirds of Starship is still occupied by LOX and methane tanks and Raptor engines. It's actually only the remaining one third of the size that is available for crew or cargo. And that's still nothing to scoff at. At nine meters wide and 18 meters high, that translates to roughly one thousand cubic meters of usable space. More pressurized space than a 747, with future extended payload variants slated that offer 22 meters of vertical storage. Starship will come in a few variants, crew and passenger, a tanker, yes, to refill other starships in orbit, cargo, lunar for the moon missions, and deep space. Well, for deep space. The multi-use platform is a true breakthrough for SpaceX because engineering, designing, building, and qualifying a spacecraft is super complex and expensive. And by making it scalable to various missions, one vehicle can perform numerous missions. So this huge size allows it to potentially transport 100 people to other planets or thousands of tons of cargo. For all these various configurations and missions, the massive scale of Starship is what makes it possible. One of these missions, perhaps, is the most ambitious project humankind has ever embarked upon. To take human beings to Mars. Clearly, Starship will become the most capable heavy launch vehicle in human history. It's one thing to dream of a one-time trip to the moon, and an entirely different vision to treat trips to Mars and the moon like commercial airline travel from airport to airport. First, we have to consider the cost. Early human spaceflight was wildly expensive. NASA between 1960 and 1973 spent $283 billion in inflation adjusted 2020 dollars. That's a whole lot of cabbage. Sure, it's one thing when we were dreaming about going to the moon and all eyes were on the Apollo program, but on our spacefaring scorecard, we're going to have to keep cost controlled if we're going to make space truly commercially viable. So how does Starship help on the cost front? First and foremost, Starship is truly novel because both Super Heavy and Starship are reusable. Now you have to remember that SpaceX has already worked on the first reusable rocket with the Falcon 9. With the Falcon 9, the first stage of the rocket, once jettisoned, could safely return to Earth, extend its landing gear, and touch down either on land or a floating barge. But with the Falcon 9, the second stage craft, the fairings and payload, were typically not destined for a return trip to Earth. We have also had second stage craft that were reusable and could return to Earth, the US Space Shuttle. Through its iterations from Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour, the Space Shuttle operated 135 missions from 1981 to 2011, when it was finally retired. When human life is on board, a one-way ticket just won't cut it. Starship is unique as it aims to reuse both the Super Heavy Stage 1 craft, which can return to Earth and land like a Falcon 9, and also the Stage 2 Starship. Unlike the space shuttle, which had room for a commander, pilot, and two to four crew members, Starship aims to transport up to 100 people on a round trip journey to the Red Planet. Through its sheer size, Super Heavy can carry enough fuel to take Starship to low Earth orbit and still have enough fuel and flight control authority to make a return trip home. Most first stage boosters are fully expended at their apex and fall perilously into the ocean, but not Starship Super Heavy. So yes, it's bigger and more massive up front, but after it does its job, it's gonna come back home, ready for its next mission. A fundamental understanding of Starship's massive size is an understanding in economies of scale. SpaceX ditched a far more expensive and complex carbon fiber structure in favor of a special alloy of stainless steel. Part of the reason is that stainless steel performs far better in the immense heat created during orbital re-entry, when a craft is traveling nearly 20,000 miles an hour, or Mach 25. At these speeds, when you go from the vacuum of space to suddenly hitting the planetary atmosphere, the air molecules cause great amounts of friction and heat. While any other material would require some series of heat reflecting tiles, the stainless steel Starship is largely unaffected, opting only to add heat tiles to the underbelly for the custom belly flop maneuver they do to slow down. 
SpaceX will optimize the manufacturing of raw materials and supply chain to make sure that the special stainless steel alloy will be as cost effective as humanly possible. Couple all of this with the fact that a single Starship can turn around and run dozens of missions with minimum maintenance and refurbishment, and you can see why costs start to fall fast. A Falcon 9, when reused, can take 15,600 kilograms to low Earth orbit, or a max of 12,000 miles or 20,000 kilometers away from the Earth. For Falcon Heavy, when reused, that number jumps to 38,000 kilograms. But a Starship reused can take over 150,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, nearly four times as much as Falcon Heavy. Remember also that there are two kinds of cost, fixed cost and variable cost. To schedule a launch, run a control room, staff the scientists and engineers to monitor the data and telemetry and other costs are fixed and don't really change all that much whether you launch a small rocket or a Starship. Other costs like the fuel do increase for the larger Starship, but are offset by the larger capabilities. This is another reason why a bigger craft will be more economically viable. Up next, we need to talk about the fuel source and engines. Decisions here are huge because while well, eventually you're gonna have to fill up on other planets, right? Imagine a pilot on a PA system on Mars. Ladies and gentlemen, we've finished refueling here at Olympus Mons Interplanetary Spaceport. Once we're free of Mars gravity and on our way to Earth, we'll be able to provide complimentary soft drink and astronaut ice cream service. God, I hope that happens in my lifetime. With all things Elon Musk, a first principles approach has greatly influenced the development and design of Starship. Take for instance, its Raptor engine, which uses liquid methane as fuel and liquid oxygen as an oxidizer, thus a Metha-Lox engine. For the full breakdown and performance metrics of this engine, I highly recommend Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronauts channel, where he has some really amazing deep dives. But the quick dirty look at the Merlin engine of the Falcon 9, the Rocketdyne RS-25 used in the space shuttle, and the Raptor engine used on Starship is quite telling. Raptor is not the most powerful, it's not the most efficient, but it does everything really well. The density of liquid methane and liquid oxygen are similar, making it easier to house them within the vessel. Liquid methane also has a higher boiling point, meaning it's easier to thermally control to keep from turning into a gas than the hydrogen used on the RS-25 in the space shuttle. This is crucial for long trips to Mars. What's probably the coolest thing about the Methalox Raptor engine is the question about refueling once you get to Mars. For early voyages, a fleet of tanker starships can be sent with a crew variant in a convoy. These tankers could carry fuel to refill the Starship once it's in orbit. Jet engines don't carry oxygen on board because they can just suck it in from the atmosphere. But spacecraft don't have this luxury and they have to bring not only the fuel, but the oxygen too. But here's where it gets really cool. Mars has carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which means if you have solar panels powering electrolysis to break down hydrogen from Martian subsurface water, you can create methane. <laughs> I know this sounds wild, and it's far from a perfected and industrialized technology on Mars. Challenges abound from sufficient sources of water and electricity to collecting and storing methane, but it's a much more viable solution than trying to store hydrogen itself, a notoriously tiny little bugger that is difficult to store. Also, thermal considerations are simpler for methane, which boils at 111 degrees Kelvin, or negative 161 centigrade. So sure, that needs to be chilled, but it's much better and easier than hydrogen, which boils at 21 Kelvin, just 21 degrees above absolute zero, the coldest temperature achievable. Looking at the new Methalox Raptor engine, we see a similar story. Methalox burns cleaner than RP-1, the fuel used in the older Merlin engines. RP-1s is basically a very refined kerosene, and it is known for some soot and other impurities in its exhaust. In comparison, methane burns much cleaner. This should mean less maintenance and refurbishment will be required to keep the Raptor engines running. SpaceX is targeting a goal of 50 launches per Raptor engine, which will be far superior to anything before it. Let's again compare the Falcon 9's Merlin engine, the Space Shuttle's RS-25, and the Raptor engine to see how price is going to be a really big deciding point going forward. The RS-25 engine costs about $50 million and is wildly expensive. The Merlin is the cheapest at $1 million and the Raptor is slated to cost around $2 million. But if we factor the specific output, how much thrust each engine makes, and the reusability, we can figure out how much it would cost per kilonewton of thrust per flight. So here, by being able to run 50 times and being relatively cheap, you can see how far ahead the Raptor engine will be. Just think, launching even a tiny little payload like a little satellite on a Starship could be cheaper than a one-time rocket system like an Electron. By making both stages reusable, 
and by developing a next-generation full-flow Methalox engine capable of 50 flights per engine, SpaceX is going to wildly disrupt the cost per kilogram of getting stuff into space. But there's so much more to this than just the economics. Until we toyed with the idea of reusability, we largely left all of our space junk in designated graveyard junk orbits. Even our decommissioned satellites of old end up here. To me, this reads just like the history of humankind's earliest forays into energy. First, we burn stuff like wood and later coal. But as we evolve, we start to clean up our act. This is how it always goes. First, solve the problem. Start to keep your family warm, cook food, and stave off predators. Only then can you start to optimize. First, we build terribly inefficient gas engines and slowly improve them and eventually switch to electric. I see the move to Starship as a step change in our evolution in space travel. Being a spacefaring people has always been one of the key ways we've judged intelligent life. And if that is to be our scorecard, then one metric we have wildly failed on is all the space junk and debris we've been too content to scatter around our planet. So inevitably, we will go from wonderment at each launch to eventually maybe having daily commercial launches to places like the moon and Mars. Maybe we'll even have space tourism. Starship is so big because for everything that comes next, it needs to be. It needs to carry more, go further, and all the while be cheaper to operate and more reusable. In this way, I think we've entered what I'd like to call Space 2.0, the next evolution of our adventure into the cosmos. So that is the story of Starship and why on earth it is so big. Big shout out to all of our viewers and especially to all of our patrons on Patreon and our YouTube channel members. Your support makes this show possible. And if you want to be a rock star supporter of this show and see more stuff like this more often, consider joining us on either Patreon or YouTube memberships. Thank you so much for watching. Take a look around. I bet there's some other videos you're going to love, like this one on Starlink and how incredibly disruptive that will be for the future of internet. All right, so that pretty much does it for us. I'm Ricky here with 2Bit DaVinci, and if you've learned nothing else in this entire video, just remember the future is going to be awesome. You know they're out there, don't you?